Hey everyone, he's titled Socialism in the Third Camp by Julius Jacobson. Nearly seven decades after civilization was made safe for democracy, and 40 years since it was resaved, the world is divided by a systematic and ideological fault that threatens not only democracy, but to depopulate the planet Earth. To the west of the global fracture are the forces of capitalism generaled by Americans with essentially loyal, though sometimes recalcitrant, European junior partners. To its east are camped the Soviet mar Soviets marshaled by the Communist Party with the obligatory of sometimes reluctant support from client states in the, quote, family of socialist nations, end quote. Each camp bristles with conventional weapons and nuclear warheads and missiles, often in des designed by benign trademarks appropriate for the technological age. ICBMs, MXs, or SSs, almost as if we were threatened by a war of flying word processors. After 40 years of shaky detents and negotiations punctured by surrogate wars and eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontations, the heads of state of the two camps have proved to be incapable of reassuring the human race that some seismic tremor it need not even be a major quake will not trigger an exchange of alphabetized weapons and thereby achieve international imperialism's final solution to all our problems. A pessimistic view? Certainly. But a realistic one that finds little comfort in the fact that the antagonisms between the two camps today lack the immediate tangible economic motivations of rival capitalist states from the 18th until the middle of the 20th century. Then, wars were fought primarily, no matter what ideology warring bourgeois powers concocted to fudge up reality, to satisfy the need for colonies as sources of raw materials, for markets for the export of goods and capital, or for strategic positions to defend imperial gain or to launch new wars of conquest. These are not the sole or immediate sources of friction in the Cold War today. Western capitalism would certainly be pleased if it had easy economic access to the Balkans, Eastern and Central Europe, but that is hardly an objective for which the West would risk even a conventional war. One would find it an impossible task to prove that American aggression in Vietnam was economically motivated or that the madness of Kennedy's eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with the Kremlin during the missile crisis had an economic rationale. Similarly, the Soviets' costly aggression in Afghanistan is not economically derivative. Even Soviet domination of half of Europe has lost much of the economic rationale of the post-World War II years when the Kremlin looted its subjugated nations. Cuba is certainly an economic liability to its Soviet benefactor. Soviet military and economic assistance to Cambodia, Vietnam, Ethiopia, Syria, Angola are costly investments without promise of material return. Libya is the beneficiary of Soviet military largesse, but it is Western capitalism which benefits as Libya's major trading partner. Even in the Middle East, where oil wells and investment are of great concern to Western capitalism, they do not have the same prized value for the Soviet camp. Footnote. While immediate economic rivalry has diminished as a source of Cold War conflict, there are important internal economic and political interests within the U.S. and the Soviet Union with a definite stake in maintaining global tensions. Above all, in the United States, where the Pentagon, which is scheduled to receive 28% of our national budget and armament manufacturers, have shown greater concern for status and profits than for survival and disarmament. In our permanent war economy, what Eisenhower warned against as the, quote, military-industrial complex, end quote, 8.5 millions are employed in war-related industries and billions realized in profits so that any drastic cutback in military allocations and easing of Cold War tensions could have serious repercussions in our economy as a whole and weaken the prestige and authority of the military establishment. The Soviet Union, too, has its military and administrative apparatuses of ribbon-bedecked generals and bureaucrats whose prestige and careers are also tied to huge socially wasteful expenditures for conventional and nuclear arms production. End footnote. 
This is not to deny the continu continuing reality of economic conflict. Each side for its own economic stability still covets foreign markets, sources of raw material and cheap imports that it would deny to the other. But if this were all that separated East and West today, and that is considerable, it would provide a modicum of optimism for preserving life on Earth. There is, however, another element in the conflict acting as a counterweight to any optimism and pulling the world in a confrontational direction, reinforcing our conviction that without the decisive intervention of a third force, a third camp, at least to deter at best to overcome the two imperialist camps, that even before this century is out, the world might be readied for the second coming. That new element is the war-making potential of ideological antagonisms reflecting the felt needs of the in and interest of two irreconcilably hostile socialism, so, I mean, social systems, capitalism and totalitarian collectivism. In the Great War, whatever separated England, France, the United States, Germany, historically, economically, and culturally, they were all capitalist powers. In fact, all the major combatants were bourgeois, democratic, pluralist societies. Except for Tsarist Russia, the most reactionary power in Europe and ally of that side which spoke most unctuously about saving the world for democracy. Ideology, therefore, merged with war propaganda, bombast, since neither side could possibly challenge the basic capitalist order of the other. All that has changed. The Soviet Union emerged out of World War II as the second great victor, and it was and remains a society in which ideology plays a special role. There, as in all capital C communist countries, the prominence of a new type of anti-capitalist class is established by the political supremacy of a bureaucratic communist party removed from all popular institutional constraint. Footnote. I will refer to totalitarian collectivist societies as capital C communist as a concession to common usage. The countries in the Soviet-led bloc stand in the same relation to communism as repression does to freedom. End footnote. Through domination of the state machinery, government footnote. Through domination of the state machinery, governmental and administrative agencies, the party establishes its economic ownership and control of the means of production. The leadership of the party, then, along with heads of subordinate state institutions, becomes the ruling class, and in almost a literal sense, the, pol the Politburo becomes its executive committee, where power, prestige, and privileges are contingent on maintaining. Political control, a bureaucratic ruling class becomes politically self or class conscious and ideology becomes a more authentic, potent weapon as the bureaucratic, ru bureaucratic ruling class strives to legitimate its power by challenging the moral and social worth and the economic position of an antithetical capitalism, where the class rule of the bourgeoisie is predicated on the supremacy of the market and private property. It is not that totalitarianism is prepared to make war for the sake of ideology, as was the case in pre-capitalist societies which embarked on crusading wars for reasons of religious doctrine as well as plunder. It is con inconceivable that the Soviets would initiate war for the sake of dogma to install totalitarian collectivist societies in the capitalist West. That is a nightmarish prospect advanced by neoconservatives to justify their own Cold War ideology. Ideology is designed to sanctify the power of the ru Soviet ruling class and its empire and is used as a political weapon in the Cold War. A comprehensive analysis of the Soviet ideology would take us too far afield, but all we need to add here is that it is used effectively in the struggle to win the, quote, hearts and minds, end quote, of millions in competition with the ideological claims of the West. Soviet ideology is by far the more sophisticated since it uses the language of socialism and liberation, albeit in the interest of a reactionary social class. 
It is most expert and effective in its anti-capitalist propaganda when addressing itself to the situation of the exploited of the third world who have felt for centuries the lash of capitalist imperialism and have not experienced, as yet with few exceptions, the reality of Soviet-style totalitarian oppression. Among the masses of South Africa, by no means your typical third world country, the Kremlin's ideological capital might well prove seductive to millions who daily come into contact with the workings of a Western, of Western finance capital. Constructive engagement in the ravings of an American president who has assured them that, quote, segregation, end quote, in their lives is all but a thing of the past. It is small wonder that capitalism remains on the defensive in a losing political war. Thus it supplements ideology with interventionism in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and with a further military response in the form of escalating the nuclear arms race. Far more affordable here, economically than in the Soviet Union, the latter in turn loyal to the hideous concept of, quote, mutual assured destruction, end quote. As a deterrent, seeks, quote, balance, end quote, by enlarging its inventory of warheads, missiles, and new weapon systems. Parenthesis. Paradoxically, for all the inter-imperialist cannonading, there exists a certain perverse reliance of the camps on maintaining the status quo and that each camp is ideologically fortified by the crimes of the other. Soviet suppression of solidarity provides indispensable copy for Radio Free Europe, while Russian propagandists have the favor returned by American intervention in Nicaragua. Certainly maintaining global tensions is viewed by both sides as the lesser evil to a de-escalation of the Cold War and the arms race impelled by the intervention of a powerful independent democratic third camp. And New section. The Cold War of the Two Camps. Understanding the depth of the struggle between conflicting, incompatible social systems and ideologies should clue one into the origins of the Cold War. The United States was the only power to emerge from World War II economically unscathed. In fact, its industry expanded enormously, labor productivity increased, and living standards improved. Even the tragic loss of American lives in Europe and the Pacific was less than that suffered by its allies. But much of Europe and the Pacific was in ruins, and for the sake of its own social and economic well-being, the U.S. was compelled to rebuild the capitalist economies of Western Europe. Huge funds were invested which had to be protected from internal and external threats to reviving capitalism. To achieve all this, the U.S. devised the Marshall Plan, pressed for an Atlantic military alliance, maintained an occupying army, army in West Germany, as well as in its Berlin sector, financed and underwrote anti-communist political movements from Athens to Marseille, or Marseille. I don't ever know how to say that. I've got to look that up right now. Oh, bitch. I accidentally closed out of my thing. That's annoying. Marseille. Marseille. Athens to Marseille and operated frenetically, often covertly, to counter communist influence in trade union organizations. An expedient wartime alliance with the Soviet Union, with all its outer gloss and inner hypocrisy, succumbed to the reality of a communist empire contagious to the border excuse me, contiguous to the borders of Western capitalism. The U.S. assumed a reactionary global posture, the Truman Doctrine, which made more pugnacious, made more pugnacious by its sole possession of the atom bomb. This doctrine had its domestic parallel in the pre-McCarthy McCarthyism that fouled the political climate during Truman's Fair Deal administrations. Um, 
The fair deal was a set of proposals put forward by U.S. President Harry S. Truman to Congress in 1945, and in Harry Truman's January 1949 State of the Union Address. More generally, the term failed fair deal characterizes the entire domestic agenda of the Truman administration from 1945 to 1953. It offered new proposals to continue New Deal liberalism, but with a conservative coalition controlling Congress, only a few of its major initiatives became law and then only if they had considerable Republican Party support. As Richard Neustadt or Neustad concludes, the most important proposals were aid to education, national health insurance, the Fair Employment Practices Commission, and repeal of the Taft-Hartley Act. They were all debated at length, then voted down. Nevertheless, enough smaller and less controversial items passed that liberals could claim some success. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, emerged victorious from the war at a cost of 20 million dead in a shattered economy. Grim testimony to the power of the Wehrmacht, as well as the depredations of Stalinist rule that left the Soviet Union so vulnerable politically, econo vulnerable politically economically, and militarily. To rebuild Soviet industry, to quote, recruit, and quote, industrial and technological personnel, to exterminate real and imagined enemies, in a phrase, to protect his totalitarian ruling class and himself as its apotheosis, Stalin decided, well before the end of the war, the half of Europe was to be replicated in the USSR's own totalitarian image and put at the disposal of the Kremlin via political intrigue, ideological warfare, and most decisively, by the power of Russian tanks and bayonets. This, thus, in the post-war period, the Kremlin constructed its empire and simultaneously looted it with a fierceness of determination and display of cruelty which surely matched the marauding armies of Genghis Khan. There was a leveling spirit to Soviet imperialism. No distinctions were made between wartime friend or foe. Czechoslovakia and Poland were allies, the earliest victims of Nazi aggression, and they were plundered. Hungary and Romania were German allies, and they were pillaged. It was the primitive accumulation of an earlier rapacious capitalism, only bloodier and more thorough. The last shot of the European war was fired in May 1945, and by September of that year, the Soviets had already robbed Czechoslovakia of 20% of its industrial plant, and rest assured that the Russians selected the best that advanced industrial nation had to, quote, offer, end quote. Poland, in short order, was bereft of 30% of what the Germans and Soviet armies during the Nazi-Soviet pact years had left to pol of Polish industry. These are what four countries picked at random. A complete list of the victims of economic brigandage would include every country in the Soviet Empire, plus the three Baltic nations incorporated into Soviet, the Soviet fatherland, along with portions of Poland. Not only factories were stolen, but a wide-ranging inventory of raw materials, goods, food. And not only material wealth, millions of human beings, 10 million is a conservative estimate, were extracted from the empire to take care of the labor shortage in the Soviet Union. Many of them died in slave labor camps to be added to the Stalinist death toll of hundreds of thousands in Eastern and Central Europe, who were murdered outright for, quote, political, end quote, reasons of state and the state of Stalin's mind. In the spirit of internationalism, Stalin did not discriminate against his Asian neighbors, neighbors as the Kremlin deindustrialized Manchuria by robbing it of almost everything and lifted what it could from Korea as well. This assessment so far of the Soviet Union in the early days of the Cold War will be challenged by many in the left. How, it will be asked, can you call this imperialism when in the anti-imperialist Soviet Union, the law of value is not operative, 
The economy does not require colonies in order to invest capital to offset a falling rate of profit. Imperialism and imperialist drives, however, are not unique to finance capitalism. When Caesar's legions first crossed swords with native Britons or made war on the Gauls, it was not to offset a falling rate of profit in Rome, but it was imperialism. When the conquistadors and the extra, extra Madara set sail, excuse me, from the extra Madura set sail for the New World, it was to seek gold to fill the coffers of the Spanish court and to kill heathens in the names of a Catholic deity. It was not to invest capital in Mexico or Peru. One second. Extra Madura. Extremadura is a landlocked autonomous community of Spain. Extremadura's capital is Marida, and its largest city is Badajoz. Located in the central western part of the Iberian Peninsula, Extremadura is crossed from east to west by the Tagus and Guadiana rivers. The autonomous community is formed by the two largest provinces of Spain, Caceres and Badajoz. Extremadura is bordered by Portugal to the west and by the autonomous communities of Castile and Leon north, Castilla La Mancha or Castilla La Mancha east, and Andalusia south. Extremadura is an important area for wildlife, particularly with the major reserve at Monfragu or Monf Monfragué, which was designated a national park in 2007, and the International Tagus River Natural Park, Parque Natural Tajo Internacional. The regional government is led by the president of the regional government of Extremadura, a, po a post currently held by Maria Guardiola of the People's Party. The day of Extremadura is celebrated on the 8th of September. It coincides with the Catholic festivity of Our, of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The region featuring an an enormous energy surplus and hosting lithium deposits is at the forefront of Spain's plans for energy transition and decarbonization. So that's extra Madura. So, when the conquistadors from the extra Madura set sail for the New World, it was to seek gold to fill the coffers of the Spanish court and to kill heathens in the name of a Catholic deity. It was not to invest capital in Mexico or Peru, yet that too was imperialism. In the same sense, when a modern anti-capitalist state occupies, absorbs, plunders weaker states and enslaves millions as the Soviet Union did in the post-war period, that is imperialism no matter what its driving force. And then, today, the Soviet Union insists on its, quote, rights, end quote, of domination for reasons of ideology and strategic reasons, which can be as powerful an imperialist dynamic as economic piracy. It remains imperialism. From the sources and for the same re excuse me, from the same sources and for the same reasons, to find some justification or moral absolution for Soviet imperialism, the argument is made that the Soviet Union was compelled to occupy half of Europe to protect itself from the imperialist designs of American capitalism. Certainly the Soviets had cause to feel threatened by the West. But for a Democrat, a liberal, above all for a socialist, how do considerations of, quote, realpolitik mitigate in the slightest the criminality of a system which, quote, defends, end quote, itself the way the Soviet Union did? Imperialism invariably cloaks itself in the investments of defense, economic, quote, defense, end quote, political and strategic, quote, defense, end quote, social, quote, defense, end quote, 
military, quote, defense, end quote. And indeed, imperialist powers might have just reason to feel threatened by imperialist competition or rebellious colonies. But the methods they use to break out of their defensive position is what makes them imperialist, antisocial, hateful. While the Soviets had reason to fear the Americans, the Americans also had much to fear from the Soviets. It was a mutual distrust, a shared animosity exacerbated by the chaotic circumstances of war-torn Europe having its origins not in the Truman Doctrine or in Russian expansionism, but in the innate, permanent, and mutual antagonism of two conflicting social systems. In brief, the American-led camp did not unilaterally initiate the Cold War, neither did the Soviet camp. They both started it. Sorry. This is like kind of embarrassing, but I really don't know how to pronounce this word. Detente. Detente. That's what I thought. Detente from above. From the time that Russia developed its own atomic bomb until today, there have been seven general secretaries of the Soviet Communist Party, including several considered, quote, liberalizers or, quote, reformers. In the United States, eight men have occupied the White House, some of whom have been representative of the liberal center of American politics. Surely all the general secretaries and all the presidents of these past 30 years realize as well as the average Muscovite or New Yorker that a nuclear arms race increases the risk of a nuclear exchange that neither side can win since there can be no victors where there will be no life. Yet, not even the basic instinct of individual and social self-preservation has had sufficient force to pressure the two camps to reach some agreement to scrap or even significantly reduce in number, the weapons of total destruction. There have been periods of relaxation, arms limitation treaties, small summits and grand summits. Nevertheless, the Cold War persists. The catalog of nuclear weapons continues to grow in quantity and, quote, quality, end quote. With the U.S. taking the lead in the nuclear arms race of which Star Wars is the latest and most frightening example. Um, I just want to, yeah, the, never mind. Um, that neither camp can be trusted to preserve life on Earth was clearly demonstrated by the recent Geneva summit. According to Pollyanna Punditry, a la New York Times, it is better to have these top-level tete et tete than for each side to bear its nuclear fangs. Undoubtedly, and they should keep talking, but it is damaging to the cause of peace to promote the illusion, as does the New York Times, that such, quote, negotiations, end quote, can do more than provide a temporary respite from the threat of nuclear war. In its contrived grand movements, its minor arrangements, accidental sideshows, and what it did not achieve, the summit managed to reveal much about our world leaders from their cultural poverty to their menacing politics. The summit, the tenth of a series, had the aura of a Cecil B. DeMille extravaganza, a year in production with a cast of thousands, more than 3,000 reporters and who knows how many spear-carrying aides at a cost running into the millions, all against a lavish background of chateaux, mansions, villas, Romantic parks and a wonderful roaring fire to warm the spirits of the two superstars comfortably ensconced on silk upholstered Louis C's fauteuil wheels. The feminine interest was not overlooked as in the best tradition of international male chauvinism. Two beautifully coutured ladies, Nancy and Reza, and Reza. The insolence of the press is boundless. Their husbands are not referred to as Ronald and Mikhail. Are trotted out for their mini-tea summit and girlish chit-chat. 
the Gorbachev couple particularly impressed reporters who were quick to point out that Mr. Gorbachev was a snappy dresser and moreover a young man, all of which bolstered some experts' perception of Gorbachev as a reforming young Turk. Gorbachev is exactly the same age as Stalin was in the mid-30s when he had already slaughtered several million Russians, but then Stalin's pants never had a crease. The Geneva scenario was long planned and rehearsed, but not everything went smoothly. There was what that carefully leaked letter in the midst of the negotiations for peace from Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, hawk-like in mien and politics, warning Reagan that he must not surrender a damn thing to the Soviets for the sake of peaceful accommodation. Our president managed to duck, smile, and dance his way out of that one. He does have an extraordinary talent for always landing on his feet. The presidential chief of staff, Reagan, launched his sexist missile. Most women, he said, simply do not, quote, understand how weights or what is happening in Afghanistan. Excuse me. Simply do not, quote, understand throw weights or what is happening in Afghanistan or what is happening in human rights, end quote. They would, quote, rather read the human interest stuff of what happened, end quote. Other presidential aides were quick to explain that their boss didn't mean what he clearly said. Gorbachev, too, had his embarrassing moments in an unexpected encounter with Jesse Jackson, who collared the Soviet leader and pressed him on the issue of Soviet anti-Semitism. Gorbachev countered Jackson with such pearls as, quote, They are fine people. They contribute a lot to our country. They are very talented people, end quote all of which proves that, quote, the so-called problem of Jews in the Soviet Union does not exist, end quote, except for, quote, those who like to mar relations, end quote. For some of us concerned with the viciousness of party-sponsored anti-Semitism, this is the claptrap of a scoundrel and a cynic. Oddly enough, Jesse Jackson, perhaps over-anxious to convey the image of himself as a diplomat and goodwill ambassador, paid his courteous respects to Gorbachev, calling him a, quote, master communicator, end quote. In the new world order of, communica of communicators that would put the great the general secretary ahead of the president, who has never been described as more than, quote, great, end quote. But what about peace? Questions of human rights, regional issues. What was achieved? Well, according to the president, in a ceremonial speech marking the end of the, quote, negotiations, end quote, the, quote, the real report card on Geneva will not come in for months, even years, but we know the questions that must be answered, end quote. What kind of a president do we have who had to go to a summit in faraway Geneva with all its co costly pomp and circumstance to learn what questions had to be answered? He could have amble, ambled down Pennsylvania Avenue and learned what the questions are from any pedestrian much more cheaply. As for the delayed report card, we don't have to wait at all for the report. We know already that the arms race is still in forward gear, that there is no evidence that agreement was reached on any substantive arms control question. We also know that even while the conferences conferees were talking to each other about peace, the Star Wars program was being accelerated. As the head of the Strategic Defense Initiative program, Star Wars, Lieutenant General James A. Abrahamson said at the time about the Star Wars program, quote, when the team comes back from Geneva, it will not be to say that we must give up, but rather that we must go ahead even faster, end quote which of course has been the case. We also learned at Geneva from a candid Mr. Gorbachev in remarks at a press conference during the summit that the questions which heretofore eluded Mr. Reagan are, quote, questions of war and peace, questions of survival, end quote, and that in his opinion, which does carry a bit of weight, to continue, quote, the Star Wars program will not only lead to a further arms race, but it means that all restraints will be blown to the winds, end quote. This makes for a rather bad report card so far. But what about the talks themselves? We learned from the president. 
his post-summit report to the Congress, in his post-summit report to the Congress, that the U.S. official team and the Soviet official team discussed a wide range of issues for 15 hours, and that, quote, approximately five of those hours were talks between Mr. Gorbachev and myself, just one-on-one, -on -one, bracket, just like a basketball matchup, end bracket. That was the best part of our fireside summit, end quote. So the best part was five hours or so. Some timekeepers of this matchup say it was six. It turns out that a whole two hours were devoted to such regional issues as Afghanistan and Nicaragua, i.e. about 20 minutes for each region, allowing 10 minutes for each side to discuss each region. The format of this discussion reeked of imperialism. A couple of distinguished heads of powerful states seeing if, in a few minutes, they couldn't settle differences over the fate of millions who were not even represented at the deliberations. But even within this imperialist framework, predictably enough, little was achieved to relieve Cold War tensions. Failing grades, for sure. Judging from a joint summit statement following the conference, the two camps barely managed to eke out some post-conference joint statement of banalities and promises to do better next time. But the American camp was quick to claim an ideological victory for its side, which was a bit presumptuous, to say the least, and indiscreetly reveals that winning or losing ideologically was more of a motive for going to the summit than any serious ambition to shift the arms race into reverse gear. There was, however, one allegedly positive outcome of almost existential proportions. According to White House authorities and confirmed by their Kremlin counterparts, when Ronald and Mikhail met and talked just one-on-one, -on -one, there was created a shared, quote, personal chemistry, end quote. They approached one another, shook hands, made eye-to-eye -eye contact as the cameras rolled, walked toward the fireplace, and something just seemed to click. Magic. It was the, quote, best part, end quote like an old-fashioned Hollywood B-movie romance. Perhaps it really happened, but it brings little comfort, for we fear that the chemistry of each man in each camp is dangerous to one's health, and we fear that an interaction of their chemistry can precipitate a lethal change in the Earth's atmosphere that might deny us all a chance to read the report card when the marks are finally in. A taunt from below, new section. For socialists, it is axiomatic that world peace cannot be assured short of the creation of a socialist commonwealth of nations. We also know that this is not in the offing and that ritualistic repetition of socialist axioms are no substitute for working towards more plausible immediate objectives such as loosening the U.S. hold on Western Europe, weakening the Kremlin stranglehold on Eastern Europe, creating nuclear-free zones. But as socialists, we also believe that to achieve those objectives, it is necessary to build a powerful international peace movement that is free of all illusions and any tie, however tenuous, to either of the two imperialist camps. It would be appalling for any American peace organization to collaborate with or invite fraternal representation from an official, quote, peace, end quote, agency of any Washington administration, whether Republicans, Republican or Democrat which manufactures nuclear weapons and maintains support, remains supportive of violent reactionary movements in societies abroad. By the same token, it is appalling that there are tendencies in the international peace movement which look upon such official, quote, peace agencies, end quote, in the East as legitimate organizations. These tendencies are exaggerated by right-wing opponents of the peace movement for their own purposes. Yet this bent axis and it should be resisted, excuse me, this bent exists, and it should be resisted by peace activists since these Soviet, quote, peace, end quote, agencies are no more committed to peace than any subservient organ of the totalitarian state. Such, quote, peace representatives to international peace gatherings stand in the same relationship to the ruling party state and to the cause of peace as do Soviet generals and tank commanders in Afghanistan heads of the KGB and Soviet jailers of authentic peace workers. As against a taunt from above based on maintaining a balance of nuclear terror, which posits a greater threat of war than of peace, third camp socialists propose a detente from below, 
pressures to de-escalate the arms race exerted by a powerful democratic international peace movement crossing continents and blocks. Such a movement, freed of all illusions about either bloc, cannot fail to strike a more responsive and lasting chord among all peoples, East and West. This detente from below implies that the peace movement reach out to the people of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, and this in turn makes it obligatory that the Western peace movement link the question of human rights and peace in the East as a moral obligation and a practical political necessity. The peace movement cannot reasonably expect to get a rousing reception from East European and Soviet dissidents in particular, or from the populace in general, if it fails to note and protest the political realities within the Eastern Bloc. The Polish people, for example, are hardly likely to respond positively to the opportunities of a Western peace movement if that movement does not take up their cause for basic democratic rights, including the right to protest the Soviet Union's nuclear presence in Poland and throughout Eastern Europe. This approach has been brilliantly elaborated by E.P. Thompson, and for his pains he has been called a CIA agent by official Soviet, quote, peace organizers, end quote, excuse me, Soviet, quote, peace, end quote, organizers. But he has been called a Soviet dupe and worse by fulminating American right-wingers and neoconservatives for his vigorous opposition to American imperialism. Anyone that slandered, anyone thus slandered by such, quote, critics, end quote, can wear these insults as a badge of honor. He must be doing something right. New section. The Third Camp. Capitalism and Soviet-type societies can never converge, but on one question... The two camps and all their chieftains, ideologues and apologists agree, be they elected politicians in capitalist democracies or Soviet apparatchiks who elect and purge each other, be they, quote, social democrats in Cold War armor or muddled pseudo-Marxist dialecticians who try to reconcile terror and, quote, economic democracy, end quote. They all share a narrow conception of the world that disallows the legitimacy, even the reality, of a third camp whose interests lie beyond and in permanent opposition to the other two. We beg to differ. There is a third camp, and it has a natural constituency far larger and potentially more powerful than what exists in either of its two enemy camps. The latter represents only a small reactionary minority, the mandarins and beneficiaries of their own ruling classes. The third camp embraces the vast majority of humanity, the working classes, and exploited peasants, the colonized victims of apartheid, jailed Polish patriots, those languishing in Pinochet's jails, courtesy of the Kissingers and Kirkpatricks, dissidents and peace activists physically abused in Soviet camps and psychiatric jails, courtesy of the Gorbachevs and his dead predecessors, and within this broadly defined third camp, socialism is its most conscious democratic and revolutionary component. The third camp, as I write this phrase, there is an extraordinary occurrence. As quiet as the night outside, three apparitions, as in a seance, have silently seeped through my room's porous brick and cracked plaster, I am soon surrounded by a trinity of ghostly shapes whom, with difficulty, I recognize as visions with whom I shared an earthbound socialist past. The first spirit I can identify as one who entered Reactions Hall of Fame as a neoconservative ideologue. The second devoted his considerable talents to servicing a con conservative labor bureaucracy and training foreign policy advisors for Nixon and Reagan. The third pale presence is less decipherable, actually more of a composite of a number of former revolutionary comrades who discovered the blessing of liberal values, the wisdom of Earl Browder. Footnote. What this composite ghost finds so beguiling about Earl Browder was the class collaborationist politics and patriotic balderdash espoused by the leader of the Communist Party, on direct orders from Moscow during the Popular Front period of mid-1936 to mid-1939. End footnote. 
if only Earl Browder had not been a Kremlin stooge. And the foolhardiness of such impractical dreamers as Eugene Debs, who for the mere sake of principle denounced World War I before and after U.S. involvement. Now these three ghosts haunt separate political caves and even do battle with one another. But for all this skirmishing, all three are partisans of the camp of bourgeois democracy, and all three share an allergy, the third less than the first two to the fairy phrase, third camp. Though some sixth sense peculiar to ghosts, excuse me, through six, some sixth sense peculiar to ghosts, having learned of my article, they have floated in for a visit to lecture and chide me for not joining what they perceive to be the, quote, real world, end quote, strange advice coming from ghosts. Quote, where, old comrade, is this third camp? Where are its countries, its armies? If David took on Goliath in unequal combat, at least he had the armies of the Israelites behind him ready to smite the Philistines. But you and your few friends have taken on two Goliaths and do not even have a suit of armor. As for the socialist third camp, that is even more ethereal than we are. Mar Karl Marx raised the, quote, specter of communism, end quote, 140 years ago, and in all that time, the specter never assumed a corporeal presence. Instead, in Europe, socialist parties have politics indistinguishable from bourgeois Democrats. In the United States, there isn't even a real party calling itself socialist. And in the Soviet Union, socialism and socialist parties are illegal. The third camp, above all, the socialist third camp is delusion, a fantasy, end quote. These are cerebral ghosts who can quote from Marx and are possessed of dialectical skills acquired in their radical socialist past. So even if only briefly, the charge made by my uninvited disembodied guest that the third camp is a delusion must be dealt with. The third camp, I reply, has been manifest time and again as a potential and a reality far more tangible than theoretical speculation. In Europe, the very fact that there exists a free, numerically large class of workers provides a significant reality to the third camp perspective. Our politics and commitments are also shaped by the existing realities of Western capitalism. In contradictions, its inherent injustice and its shared responsibility for a Cold War that threatens global destruction. In terms of promoting social justice and human survival, we find it more realistic to address ourselves to the potential forces of an as-yet non-existent army of third-camp socialism in Europe than to delude ourselves that Western capitalism can ever become a force of her peace and social democracy. And history validates our commitment. We know that the working class and its natural allies, particularly in Europe, are subject to great changes of mood and consciousness. Where millions of, worker, where millions of workers confidently marched off to war in 1914, millions of those who survived the carnage mounted the barricades in Germany and Russia in a class war against capitalism. They were defeated, the reasons for which cannot be examined here. Just let it be noted that one reason for that defeat was the role played by the political and spiritual ancestors of the phantoms crowding my typewriter. But more important here is that passivity and acquiescence is not a natural condition of the working class. We need not go back 70 years. The French working class and its natural allies were also relatively quiescent in the Gaullist years. Yet in 1968, they came within centimeters of shattering the Fifth Republic. And most recently, again in France in 1981, the working class and its allies and their vast majority voted for and elected a socialist government. That, in a sense, they were defeated by the government they placed in power is, again, not the most important question, lesson of our, for our discussion. More relevant is that in France and throughout Europe, workers think of themselves as people united by special class interests and that millions vote for socialist and communist parties. I, not the still hovering ghost, would be euphoric if the working class displayed more revolutionary zeal. If they voted for militant socialist parties, which do not exist, and if they all understood that the communist parties are antithetical to their class interest. That this is not the case is indeed disquieting, but the living evidence of persistent a persistent socialist tradition and class consciousness reinforces the third camp socialist perspective. How strong this tradition actually is was demonstrated above all in the past decade in the Iberian countries. 
During the Spanish Civil War and in the aftermath of Francoist terror, the flower of Spain's revolutionary proletariat and peasantry and their allies among the intelligentsia was largely destroyed, and those who survived did so under the most adverse conditions or fled their homeland. Yet after 40 years of fascism, the remnants and heirs of their, this depleted proletariat and their allies overthrew Franco and rallied to parties of the left, sat testifying to the viability of a socialist culture and consciousness. True, again, it would have been be best had the Spanish working class emerged from under Frank the Franco dictatorship behind the real flag of revolutionary socialism. It would also have been more of a miracle than the appearance of three ghosts who are still by my side. Meanwhile, the plausibility of third camp socialism has been advanced by Spanish events as it has been by similar developments in Portugal. Twelve years ago, a powerful movement from below rid that impoverished nation of a 50-year-long dictatorship. And in February 1986, an absolute majority of voters elected the leader of the Socialist Party as Portugal's president. Third Camp Socialists find little to cheer about Mr. Soares is politics, but we take heart from what the vote reflects about the consciousness of workers and peasants who supported his candidacy. And the third camp, in its broadest sense, demonstrated its reality with the European peace movement rallying millions on the continent and in England in demonstrations and acts of civil disobedience to protest the emplacement of perishing missiles in Europe, making clear at the same time their opposition to the Soviet Union's SS-20s aimed at their capital cities. The movement did not achieve its immediate objectives, but it is alive and its potential as a third camp force is enormous. Third camp socialists, I continue, find sustenance in events in South Africa where the black working class plays a leading political role in the struggle against apartheid. The recently organized COSATU, whose program projects a South Africa that is non-racialist, pluralist, democratic, and assures autonomy for the organized working class, augurs well for the third camp. And we are encouraged by the democratic swell from below in the Philippines that has grown to a tidal proportion despite Reagan's embrace of Marcos Caligula as a friend. Just as we have, are heartened by the fact that it, is, it was the Haitian people who deposed Duvalier, the bloody, with whom the U.S. had collaborated. My uninvited guests are showing signs of irritation. They think that I read too much into all this, which is their right. Quote, in any case, end quote, they ask, quote, what about the East, where the masses are denied elementary democratic rights by totalitarian states? How can you even dream of a third camp there, end quote? My response is that in the communist world, the reality of the third camp has been affirmed repeatedly from the time of Stalin's death until today. We saw it in the rising of the East Berlin working class. Three years later in the glorious Hungarian Revolution, which had the clear support of the overwhelming majority of the population with revolutionary objectives spelled out, freedom, democracy, socialism. The third camp demonstrated its powers in Poland in 1956, again in 1960 and 1970. It was pronounced in the heady days of the Prague Spring when an entire nation rallied around the cause of socialism with a human face. And most recently, of course, in Poland in solidarity, which embraced the entire working class and with the virtually unanimous support of peasants, students, intellectuals. It was a trade union movement and a democratic movement and any movement in a totalitarian society that struggles for working class autonomy and seeks even minimum political rights strikes at the very heart of the totalitarian social system. These movements have been repressed, but they have not disappeared. No group knows this better than the men. There are no women in the leading bureau of the Com Soviet Communist Party. They fear not only a renewal of revolutionary struggle within their empire, but realize better than many Soviet experts in the West that not even the Soviet Union is immune to the contagion of revolution. And the third camp character of the re of rebellion in the Eastern Empire is evidenced in the cautious and hesitant response of Western capitalism. 
of, quote, bourgeois democracy, end quote, if you will, to any powerful democratic movement from below in the East. Reagan and his sort can mount their formal respects to solidarity, especially when it is repressed, since that can be used effectively in Cold War propaganda. But do not be deceived. The Reagan of this, the Reagans of this world would rather deal with a Yaroselsky than with a Walesa. Or how do you say it? Waleza. Waleza. How do you say that guy's name? Lech Waleza. Or Lech Walesa. As a representative of a free democratic Poland forged in struggle. For this, is there not the evidence that of the Prague Spring? When on the 18th of August, 1968, President Johnson, replying to an inquiry from General Secretary Brezhnev, made it clear that despite the Czech upheavals, the U.S. would abide by the Yalta Agreement. Three days later, Soviet tanks rumbled through the streets of Prague, with Czechoslovakia eventually removed as a, quote, trouble spot, end quote, the two camps were able to renew ideological and political warfare in their accustomed way. The above is not intended to convey a spirit of great optimism. There is, in fact, much more about the real world than to engender pessimism than cheer. It is true that in Europe there is not a single mass party to which a third camp socialist can point with pride. In the U.S., the majority of the white working class, even at least half of the white trade unionists, voted for Ronald Reagan. In the third world, it is authoritarianism which is making greater headway than democracy or socialism. All I have tried to establish is that the fight for the third camp is based on something more substantial than piety. The world is not static. The class struggle and the struggle for democracy exist as an active political reality. Colonial resistance to imperialism is also a reality. Socialist consciousness is not vanished. Capitalism is not a stable system, and we know how we know historically how its periodic breakdowns can change the political climate dramatically. Footnote. Reagan's popularity, for example, is based primarily on improved economic conditions, not because he is convincingly, quote, communicating, end quote, family values and patriotism. Remember that in 1981, when unemployment was around 11% and inflation running high, the polls indicated that Reagan's popularity had declined precipitously lower than most presidents after one year in office. End footnote. Totalitarian collectivism is far more fragile than many would have us believe, and resistance from below is an ongoing reality with international implications. These realities and possibilities provide sustenance for third camp socialists. Bourgeois democracy in the third camp. Let us say that third camp socialism does not have a ghost of a chance, so to speak. What then? Politics, as the cliché goes, involves choices. This is the cliché of realpolitik. These still hovering emanations understand, so partly out of curiosity, I ask the three spirits, quote, if the socialist third camp is a mirage, where can its scattered troops go if they are still motivated to fight the good fight for social justice, economic equality, to rescue the environment and pressure humankind from the threat of nuclear incineration? End quote. Social justice, equality, the environment, preserve humankind, all of it. Question, exclamation point. These are hardly the concerns of the neoconservative sprite whose normally pallid complexion has become livid, unsightly for a ghost, and muttering some invective about Kami Simp. He floats away, probably to the office of the national interest, to let loose another ideological missile at the evil empire. And the second phantom, whom I had once been so fond of, is no more responsive, he too leaves the way he came, muttering some dep deprecations about, quote, sectarian idiots, end quote, and something more colorful. He is probably drifting his way to the offices of Albert Shanker, 
who may not be at his desk since he indicated recently that he might be volunteering for armed service with the Contras, or perhaps he is cruising to the headquarters of the National Endowment for Democracy to advise his protégés on ways and means of funneling more of the taxpayers' money to some reactionary organization, semi-fascist if necessary, fighting communism in Europe, the Third World, or wherever. Who's Albert Shanker? Albert Shanker, who lived from 1928 to 1997, was president of the United Federation of Teachers from 1964 to 1985 and president of the American Federation of Teachers from 1974 to 1997. Back to the text. But the third composite apparition, the socialist turned liberal, remains. He has not lost the drive to proselytize in narrower radical circles on behalf of his newfound faith in liberalism and the welfare state. I quote his barely audible advice verbatim, quote, you, have, you do have an alternative. First, you must shed all apocalyptic visions, free yourself from all chiliastic dogmas, Wipe out your millenarian manifestos, unburden yourself of socialist intransigence, then take a deep breath and join, as I did, the camp of liberalism of the democratic welfare state. It may not be the best of all possible worlds, but it is the best there is in this tragic universe. You must learn to appreciate the positive good in democracy and liberal values. Bourgeois democracy allows for human growth and progress. It has an electoral system, and through it, we can bend the state to serve the interest of all. If we play our cards right, we might even win a bigger and better New Deal, which would be, after all, a kind of socialism. In any case, be realistic. Your orgiastic drives towards a chiliastic socialism have not worked. At least in the camp of liberalism, you will find many friends in functioning, res functioning responsibly within the framework of bourgeois democracy. You will, at last, be in and of this world, end quote. Emphasis provided by inflection of the ghost voice. With the tired old advice, with this tired old advice, an equally weary ghost vanished, perhaps to write yet another volume crucifying socialism on the cross of American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is the belief that the United States is either distinctive, unique, or exemplary compared to other nations. Proponents argue that the values, political system, and historical development of the United States are unique in human history, often with the implication that, is it, that it is both destined and entitled to play a distinct and positive role on the world stage. It originates in the observations and writings of French political scientist and historian Alexis de Tocqueville, most notably his in his comparison of the United States with Great Britain and his native France. Tocqueville was the first writer to describe the country as, quote, exceptional, end quote, following his travels there in 1831. The earliest documented use of the ter specific term, quote, American exceptionalism, end quote, is by American communist and intra-communist disputes in the late 1920s. Seymour Martin Lipset, a widely cited political scientist and sociologist argues that the United States is exceptional and that it started from a revolutionary event. Lipset therefore traces the origins of American exceptionalism to the American Revolution, from which the U.S. emerged as, quote, the first new nation, end quote, with a distinct ideology and having a unique mission to transform the world. This ideology, which Lipset called Americanism, but is often also referred to as American exceptionalism, is based on liberty, egalitarianism, individualism, republicanism, democracy, laissez-faire economics. These principles are sometimes collectively referred to as, quote, American exceptionalism, end quote. 
As a term in social science, American exceptionalism refers to the United States' status as a global outlier. Critics of the concept claim that the idea of American exceptionalism suggests that the U.S. is better than other countries, has a superior culture, has a unique mission to transform the planet and its inhabitants. Back to the text. First of all, I must remark that in all this, my compassionate ghost has taken on the added area airiness of a latter-day Columbus rediscovering America from the prow of the Staten Island Ferry as it passes the Statue of Liberty. Bourgeois democratic rights, liberal values, the electoral process, etc. are all treated in essays and volumes as a treasure never properly appreciated at all by millenary and socialists. There is something terribly disingenuous about this with its sly insinuation that socialists are not sufficiently appreciative, some even hostile to democracy. Oddly enough, several component elements of this composite liberal ghost and I were brought up in the same socialist movement, and unless my memory deceives me, we were all contemptuous of bourgeois democracy as a political and class system. But we never ignored or undervalued and certainly never reveled reviled bourgeois democratic political rights. We never denounced freedom of speech, right of assembly, the right to vote, to organize, all the rights we generally think of as liberal or bourgeois democratic. Third Camp Socialism always aspired to political freedom and popular democratic social controls far beyond what liberal capitalism could either realize or even promise. Above all, with the rise of Stalinism, which is so horribly disfigured and negated the socialist vision, Third Camp Socialists, more than any other political tendency, have underscored the value of democracy, even the limited and sometimes tentative democracy of the liberal capitalist state. It is our very sensitivity to the importance of democracy that is responsible for our sensitivity to the failures of a liberal capitalist society where democratic symbols and practice so often diverge from and sometimes clash with political reality. Far from our very inception as a nation, our laws and institutions have had as their primary, though not exclusive, function the preservation of the rights and interests of property-owning classes. Given the primary role of the liberal book capitalist state, many of our democratic rights, including those guaranteed by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, have not been gained as a gift from the bourgeois democratic state. They had to be fought for, often in bitter, bitter protracted, and sometimes violent struggles, and often led by forces opposed to capitalism itself. Capitalism, as it emerged in the post-Civil War period for all its political pluralism, was hardly a force for extending and de preserving democracy. Not many politicians and fewer industrialists took kindly to universal suffrage, the right to life of Native Americans, racial equality, women's rights, the right of working people to organize and to strike, etc., just as they resisted remedial social welfare legislation. Were it not for the, quote, millenarians, end quote, of the 19th century, including, quote, chiliastic, end quote, socialists, and anarchists, there might be far less for the ghosts of socialism's past to applaud about liberal values. Even the civil rights victories of recent decades were less a tribute to an abstract bourgeois democracy than to the concrete activism in men and women prepared to break the law and suffer the consequences for the sake of forcing minimal reform laws, minimal reform laws out of the bourgeois state, including rights promised by the laws of the land nearly two centuries earlier. History has proven that democracy is not an inherent indissoluble function of capitalism. We know how in European countries democracy has been sloughed off by the ruling class in times of deep social crisis. There is nothing exceptional in the American experience to guarantee that it could not happen here. This is one reason why third camp socialists, for whom political and social democracy are the heart and soul of their, quote, chiliasm, end quote, have more to offer as watchdogs of democracy, even of the restricted democracy of liberal capitalism, than those who have abandoned independent socialist struggle for the sake of promoting liberal values and compromising them inside the headquarters of the Democratic Party, which is and will remain in this real world, not on cloud nine, a bureaucratically organized party of the bourgeoisie.
Democracy is more than a matter of laws and institutions. Democracy also involves questions of moral and social attitudes, of consciousness. And I know that when the ghost who has just left my side genuflects before the liberal, quote, values, end quote, it is not only to honor the electoral process, but in deference to what he sees as a strong egalitarian spirit in American life, which, quote, millenarian, end quote, socialists supposedly ignore, underestimate, in their narrow dogmatic sectarianism. Our sense of economic history, however, is no less keen that 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 than that of the newly arrived liberal reformers. But our perceptions differ and the lessons we draw are not the same. In the new world, men and women did carve homes, farms and towns out of a wilderness. Hundreds of thousands came here seeking refuge from religious and political persecution. There were powerful grassroots agrarian, populist, and reform movements. For these, among at least a dozen other historical reasons, there was created a kind of leveling spirit in the 19th century. But it has been terribly exaggerated, mythicized, and politically misused by liberal theorists parading, quote, values, end quote, in our heritage to justify their retreat from radicalism. The principle that I am as good as anyone else, that I, a laborer, am as good as you, the banker or politician, perhaps better, is commendable and is deeply embedded in the American psyche. But that is not a true leveling, read liberal or democratic spirit, which it lacks. Excuse me. But that is not a true leveling, read liberal or democratic spirit when it lacks the reciprocal notion that in basic human terms, anybody else is as good as I am, particularly if that anybody else happens to be black, oriental or Native American, Jew, Muslim, Papist or Taoist, Hispanic, Pole, Italian, gay or lesbian. Despite the mythology of our liberal values, the countervailing immoral forces of xenophobia, prejudice, and bigotry cutting across class and most social categories has scarred the American character almost from our inception as a nation. This meanness of spirit, a desecration of liberal, quote, values, end quote, is more constrained today in its surface manifestations, which is laudable, but it remains pervasive and tenacious. It sees and continues to flare into open, ugly acts. This may not be revealed in polls. It is not quite respectful, excuse me, respectable today to admit to racial hatred, for which we are thankful. But anyone who reads newspapers, watches television news, talks to neighbors, listens to even half an ear to people, in other words, anyone who, quote, lives in and of this world, end quote, knows that this is true. This fact alone is powerful indictment of liberal capitalism since antisocial attitudes are not instinctive or genetically transmitted but historically and culturally determined. No social system with 200 years of history behind it can escape judgment for its failure to eliminate such a social virus from mass consciousness. It is a reality that is not peculiar to American life, but appears to be endemic to all national bourgeois cultures and weighs heavily in our choice of a, quote, chiliastic, end quote, socialist third camp. When third camp socialists are dismissed as, quote, orgiastic, end quote, in the utopianism, the socialists turned bourgeois Democrats or who now seek to conciliate, quote, the best, end quote, in liberal capitalism and social democracy, posit as a realistic possibility a rather quixotic vision of a social welfare state that functions as a vast national arbitration board. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing that right. It's not quixotic, is it? It's quixotic, right? Quixotic? Sorry. Quixotic. Okay, it is quixotic. Back to the text. A state which adjudicates differences between such economic categories as labor and capital, quote, categories, end quote, is more al-Quran, a term 
than, quote, class, end quote, judiciously caters to the special needs of farmers, wisely balances conflicting sectional interests, promotes policies to overcome racial and ethnic discord, appropriates funds for progressive social programs, sees to it that banks invest capital rationally and for the social wheel, is a state beholden to no economic class, special interest group or political party, only to the national good and a grateful support of electorate. The emerging social order will be neither precisely capitalism nor exactly socialism, but a blend of the two, representing the triumph of reason and class collaboration. The final conflict between working class and capitalist class is replaced by the final victory of a quasi-bourgeois, quasi-social democratic enlightenment. The idea of a classless state in a class society is not nearly as novel or interesting as its recent converts from socialism would like to believe. It not only has elements of 19th century utopianism, but approximates the conceptions of reformist European social democratic parties for most of this century, parties which have mass followings and have achieved governmental sorry, power. Yet, at no point did they say or could they create a society or a state bearing the faintest resemblance to the class collaborationist Elysium laid out like blueprints in recent volumes. One second. I don't know what that means. Um, okay, back to the text. I can't find what uh, all I see means in, a, in an efficient fashion. It keeps showing me the movie. Um, this is not to deny that the bourgeois state can promote welfare programs, take punitive action against corporate abuse of power, sponsor progressive tax legislation, support worthy labor legislation, even nationalize a sick industry, etc. What the liberal welfare state cannot do, however, is to replace the authority of corporate boards, managers, bankers with the authority of the producers. The state can mediate between labor and capital. The state can even side with labor in special cases against the immediate interest of capital, but the state can neither expropriate the bourgeoisie nor create a socio-economic system that is half capitalist, half socialist. Footnote. Take as a concrete example the Reagan administration's quandary when faced with... One second. the threat of the giant Chrysler Corporation going bankrupt. The government saw but two options, allow Chrysler to go under as some free enterprise purists in the administration advocated or provide huge financial assistance to bail out Chrysler. The latter course was followed. One option was that that was not and could not be considered was to seek the removal of the corporate board, placing Chrysler in the hands of its employees, or even to demand a board equally divided between employers and elected representatives of the workers with the political and economic backing of a sympathetic or administration. On the contrary, the government's rescue package was contingent on enormous sacrifices by the Chrysler workers, the notorious, quote, givebacks, end quote. Could a liberal democratic administration headed by Walter Mondale, who had the support of social democrats come liberals, have considered options as basic variants, a basic variance with those considered by the Reaganites? The question is obviously rhetorical. Perhaps such an administration would have been less punitive towards the workers, but even that is doubtful. If it is hard to imagine the democratic socialization of a single giant sick giant corporation, how much more far-fetched is the notion of a bourgeois welfare state embarking on a national economic policy of creeping socialism or semi-socialism, of promoting the expropriation of capitalist God-given right to their ownership and control of the means of production? End footnote. Look at Roosevelt and the New Deal. This is particularly relevant today because it is becoming the de rigueur for those who have abandoned the socialist third camp to become social reformers to look back on the New Deal experience with nostalgia and retroactively berate left-wing socialists of the 1930s, themselves included, for their refusal to support the Roosevelt administrations. If 
Only they had taken a positive view of the New Deal, worked within its coalition, and tried nudging it ever so gently to the left. Then, well, all sorts of wondrous things might have happened. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the paragon of an intelligent bourgeois democratic statesman precisely because, in his administrations, Roosevelt revealed that he understood the difference between a capitalist businessman and a capitalist politician. Where the business of a businessman is business, the business of a capitalist statesman is the preservation of the social order. A successful businessman is not required to look beyond the market place and a successful investor has to know where to place his bets on the stock market. On the other hand, a good bourgeois statesman has a social overview. He's concerned with images and ideology and understands that for the sake of social peace and the health of the economic system as a whole, it might be necessary for government to intervene in the private economic sector, sometimes punitively, even if that arouses the ire of, quote, economic royalists, end quote, instinctively hostile to regulatory incursions on their corporate power. All this Roosevelt understood, and he acted accordingly, creating a par partial welfare state in the face of resistance from, quote, economic royalists, end quote, and reactionary politicians. But the New Deal was designed to save capitalism from capitalism itself at a time when the whole system seemed to be crumbling from within and was faced by a real threat of class war. Excuse me, class warfare. Now this view that the so New Deal now this view that the New Deal aimed at stabilizing capitalism did not mean that socialists should have opposed specific reforms and ameliorative programs than any more then any more than third camp socialists could possibly oppose reforms and remove themselves today from the struggle against Reagan's efforts to turn back the clock. The point is that as socialists our sights are aimed far beyond the bourgeois democratic welfare state, and we do not De deceive ourselves or others that FDR's New Deal, Truman's Fair Deal, Kennedy's New Frontier, or the reforms of Johnson's Great Society ever held forth the promise of socialism or creeping capitalism or of some mythical kingdom blending the best of liberal capitalism and socialism. To reject the contemporary reevaluation of the New Deal by socialist turned liberals is not to accept any simple reductionist class view of American bourgeois politics past or present. There were and remain significant differences between the Democratic and Republican parties. Roosevelt and Hoover, Mondale and Reagan were and are not merely the Tweedledums and Tweedledees of capitalism. The question is whether the differences justify the abandonment of an independent socialist perspective and whether socialism in the U.S. and internationally is no more than a utopian moral ideal, so that the best we can do is to devote our energies to the more liberal of the two parties, the Democrats. Obviously, we do not believe that the differences are that great or that socialism is nothing more than a philosophical, capital I, ideal. And this places us in opposition to those on the left, actually the liberal left, who have rediscovered that old pitied path, excuse me, that old pitted path to instantaneous success, the Democratic Party. We know from experience that socialists devoted to this strategy wind up submerging socialist politics for the sake of expediency. Invariably, it is expediency which emerges as the principle. In the process, such socialists may be cleansed of sectarianism, but also of a distinctive radical ideology and independence without which socialism is denied a present and can have no future. In fact, as often as not, socialists come Democrats are cleansed of much of their liberalism. Uh, new section without a title. Or maybe it's not a new section, but there's a space, you know? You know, and you're reading something and there's like, well, a space. Um, where like, there's just the next line, but then there's like a space. There's sometimes there's like a big space between paragraphs. There's a big space between paragraphs. <laughs> uh, by 1980, the limited welfareism of bourgeois democracy had a 35-year history of uneven development. What was initiated in the Roosevelt administration was strongly advanced in the Johnson administration. 
It appears to be a permanent political fixture, not even seriously tampered with by Eisenhower, Nixon, or Ford. Yet in a brief five years, Ronald Reagan has proven what Chile, quote, Chileastic, end quote, socialists knew all along, that welfareism is no more a success necessary ingredient of bourgeois democracy then democracy is inseparable from bourgeois rule reagan may be a media package and a master of misspeak but he is an ideologue who knows what he wants and how to get it and what he wants is counter-reformation a quote revolution end quote as reagan calls it in the more zealous moments of his assault on welfareism to benefit and expand the quote private sector end quote and whose primary victims are the are minorities the poor the elderly the working class students children the environment the organized labor movement women's rights cultural programs yet despite reaganism the u.s remains a bourgeois democracy we remain a pluralist society we have a free press the right of assembly avenues of protest free speech workers have the right to strike and to join unions the point is that if socialists want to devolve into liberals it cannot be to join the camp of welfareism for that is not a camp when one talks of camps or blocks one is speaking of class and social systems not of some Im permanent aspect or phase of the system. The Eastern Bloc is the camp of a totalitarian social system, which has its variants. The Western Bloc is the camp of capitalism, also a social system, with its welfaristic and conservative variants. If a socialist decides, for whatever reason, to render his or her independent socialist perspective to work within the camp of bourgeois democracy, he slash she has chosen a camp in which the Reagans, Thatchers, and Coles have a natural place no less, perhaps more than the representatives of moderate bourgeois welfareism. And if we abandon socialist intransigence to work for liberal values in this bourgeois democratic camp, let us not forget that we are not only in the same camp as conservatives, but that it is a camp which sought out, propped up, installed every conceivable sort of villain and tyrant as an ally and friend of the, quote, free world, end quote. Above all, it is the United States which is pulled into its periphery, and thereby into the periphery of the West, a cast of characters and satellites which resemble a veritable theater of Grand Guignol. Particularly in Latin America, the U.S., in order to protect enormous economic investments, sources of raw materials, and to defend the, quote, free world, end quote, in the Cold War, has supported extant dictators or created them. Literally hundreds of thousands of people longing for a taste of, quote, liberal values, end quote, have been slain by homicidal regimes in power on Washington's sufferance. In Duvalier's Haiti, Chile, Batista's Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Somoza's Nicaragua, El Salvador, Argentina, and Brazil, and Guatemala when controlled by the juntas, etc. Not merely the U.S. stands so accused, but the West as a whole, which has revealed a penchant for anti-communist dictatorships as natural allies in its ideological war against communist dictatorships, allies such as Turkey today or Iran and Greece when governed by autocratic military elites skilled in the arts of political repression, torture, assassination, and mass killings. And not merely the conservatives in the West stand so accused. The finest representatives of bourgeois liberalism and power are also guilty. In the U.S., repressive imperialist policies were pursued by progressivist welfarist bourgeois democratic administrations going back to Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, to Truman, Kennedy, and Johnson, and yes, in between, even by the paragon of the bourgeois democratic welfare state, FDR. Not even militant socialists turned liberal Democrats with a capital D can be absolved from responsibility for the sordid record of Western imperialism once they declare their fundamental solidarity with the West. A long time ago, one of my visiting ghosts made a not-so-ringing declaration that he was abandoning third-camp socialism because it lacked, quote, energy, end quote, end quote, our place, bracket, as democratic socialist, end bracket, is in the Western camp, end quote. I don't know if that's a reference to Max Shackman or whoever. Um, 
The imperialist visions, divisions between Stalinism and capitalism, he explained, was also, quote, the struggle between two ways of living, between bracket bourgeois and bracket democracy, however marred, and the most bestial totalitarianism ever known, end quote. Whether the Stalinist gulag was more bestial than the Nazi Holocaust is open to question, but not relevant here. More to the point is that the, quote, ways of living, end quote, in the democratic West cannot be properly understood and judged when divorced from the, quote, ways of living, end quote, tolerated in, in or imposed on third world countries. In the United States, much of our better economic living and better political, i.e. democratic living, is contingent on living off the misery of people in the third world, the exploitation of their laboring masses and natural resources, and our superior, quote, ways of living, end quote, are defended ideologically in the Cold War by multinationals, bankers and bourgeois politicians who feel more secure with a Pinochet than an Allende, or excuse me, Allende, and take more seriously the advice of Kissinger or Kirkpatrick than of liberal ghosts from socialism's past. The West, then, is not, quote, marred, end quote, by imperialism, but is in part defined by it. The nouveau liberal Democrats who abhor death squads in El Salvador and might even be appalled by contra-terrorists in Nicaragua nevertheless bear their share of guilt for the crimes of Western imperialism once they announce that, quote, our place is in the Western camp, end quote. Their responsibility vis-a-vis -vis their chosen Western camp is analogous to the responsibility of apologists for Soviet totalitarianism who repudiate aspects of Soviet domestic and foreign policies which violate their political sensibilities such as anti-Semitism or suppression of solidarity in Poland, but cannot avoid political and moral responsibility for repugnant acts logically executed by a social system or a camp with which they identify or defend in some fundamental way. Converts from radicalism to welfareism and liberal, quote, values, end quote, are frequently so abstract in their discussion of New Deal-type societies that they make it difficult to come to grips with their arguments. Their evidence is selective, ignoring or downplaying the darker side of welfare states as they really were, as though the welfare state could be defined simply by highlighting some choice progressive social legislation in an otherwise interesting book on socialism by a leading American ideologue of enlightened social welfareism, though through magic and sophistry in a chapter aptly called The Invisible Mass Movement, the Democratic Party was transmorgified into a sort of Labour Party. What a shock for the party chieftains to learn this. And Ger George Meany turned Cinderella-like into a sort of closet socialist, which must have shocked George as much as it did many readers. Most extraordinary, though not really, in the chapters dealing with American socialism and this welfare state, there are hardly a dozen sentences on the Vietnam War. None substantive, certainly never critical. Yet, how was it possible to discuss Johnson and the Great Society and not interpret and relate both the man and his welfare state to the realities of their dirty war? It's easy if, in the first place, you were really a critical supporter of that war, as was the case in this instance, and second, if the realities of that war intrude on your cheery vision of the potentialities inherent in some abstract, quote, welfare state, end quote. I don't know who he's referring to uh, as here. If he's, he's not, I don't think he's referring to himself. As was the case in this instance, he says. I don't know if that means Jacobson himself. I don't think it was Jacobson. He's referring to Shagman, but I'm not sure. In this vein, it is possible to evaluate Kennedy's new frontier divorced from the realities of the frontier that encroached on Cuban rights in the Bay of Pigs fiasco, or the terrifying eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with Khrushchev during the missile crisis that threatened nuclear war. Was Truman's fair deal to be judged on the basis of his veto of Taft-Hartley, or do we see some organic link between his bourgeois democratic welfare state and the Korean War? Not to mention the strike-breaking, union-busting, McCarthyite proclivities of that administration. And how does one integrate into a social and class analysis, or shouldn't one bother, that it was Truman or the heir 
of FDR's New Deal in 1945. He was responsible for the greatest war crime of World War II, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. To return to FDR and his New Deal, are they to be understood solely, even primarily, in terms of domestic welfare legislation, much of its value exaggerated, often misunderstood, sometimes a mixed blessing, or, for a deeper, more complete assessment of the New Deal, do we also look at the reprehensible role of FDR and his administration during the Spanish Civil War, when he made the Neutrality Act of 1935 a legalizing shipment of war material immediately applicable to Spain, thereby making it impossible to aid the anti-Franco forces? FDR reinforced that move in 1937, when at his behest, the Senate and the House of Representatives unanimously passed, except for one dissenting vote in the House, an embargo act specifically designed to prevent shipment of war goods to Spain. Small wonder that, for these services, Franco described Roosevelt as a, quote, true gentleman, end quote. And how does one esteem a president in his new deal with all, which all but shut the doors to Jewish immigration by the end of the 1930s, a heartless policy that cost the lives of thousands? What of FDR, the New Deal, and the war against fascism? Do we prize the New Deal and its architect on the basis of hollow rhetoric about four freedoms, or do we judge them by the way that war was fought? The truth is that in the war against fascism, neither Roosevelt nor his administration could, or even tried to, arouse the mass of people to a high level of democratic consciousness. How could they aspire, inspire democratic fervor when FDR and the New Deal fought the war in a fundamentally reactionary way? Are we to ignore the fact that the war for democracy was fought by a segregated army, modified somewhat only in its waning days? How do we characterize the incarceration of 125,000 Japanese Americans, the majority American-born? Domestically, the war accented the class character of the New Deal society as capitalists accumulated huge profits while workers had to fight for even modest gains in, vastly, in a vastly expanded economy. Militarily, the Allies wiped out entire cities, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians in mass airstrikes that had no military value other than terror. When the Nazis destroyed Warsaw and Rotterdam, the U.S. charged the perpetrators as war criminals. What did that make the government of the, quote, welfare state, end quote? And, wartime re and the wartime record of our bourgeois democratic welfare state vis-a-vis -vis European Jewry will live in infamy. Think of what could have been done by FDR and the New Deal to save untold thousands from the Holocaust. But fear of antagonizing reactionaries and anti-Semites was greater than the concern for Jewish life. Surely this cruelty of inaction reflected the callousness of the administration itself. One would be hard to find a single speech by FDR in the early days of the war, when the Nazi campaign of extermination was already known, in which he applied his powerful oratorical skills to alert the country and the world to the dimensions of the Holocaust and to express American resolve to combat such bestiality politically and militarily. While the U.S. engaged in terror strikes against civilian centers at great loss of planes and personnel, not to mention civilian victims, the Roosevelt administration refused to order far less risky airstrikes to destroy the ovens of Auschwitz, a scant few miles from the town of Auschwitz, which had been attacked several times by waves of bombers. The above is just a small number of a much larger list that could be compiled in an indictment of the New Deal type of welfare administration. Are they just incidental to an understanding of what happens to, quote, liberal values, end quote, in times of crisis? I think not. They are not the whole story, but they are an indispensable part of the story. They are historical realities which confirm our disbelief that through this bourgeois democratic welfare state we will reach the promised land of semi-socialism, semi-capitalism, and they reinforce the necessity for third camp socialism. New section. section, the third camp or the lesser evil. Support for the Western camp is often presented not in terms of positive and potential good, but as a, quote, lesser evil, end quote, to, to the totalitarian camp. The injustices of capitalism, the flaws in a democratic welfare state are sometimes conceded, but it is argued that in the absence of an organized third camp, alternative, 
One must support the West because democratic capitalism is a, quote, lesser evil, end quote, to totalitarianism. This concept of the lesser evil as an operative principle has been the bane of the socialist movement throughout its history. It, was, it has the seductive simplicity of a truism. There is always a lesser evil in politics. Not even fascist Italy matched the evil of Nazi Germany. That would make, that would make the former a lesser evil. The question is what, if anything, follows from that? What if through some strange set of circumstances there had been an open confrontation between, between Il Duce and Der Führer? Should socialists have supported Italian fascism in the absence of a viable socialist alternative? Bourgeois democracy is the lesser evil to totalitarian collectivism. It is inconceivable that any democrat, socialist, Marxist could think otherwise. Capitalism, even in democratic garb, is despicable, but certain basic liberties and cultural freedoms exist in the West that are denied in the East. In addition, people generally enjoy a higher standard of living in the West. And because the West is democratic, albeit bourgeois, there is a greater possibility that pressure from below can effectuate salutary changes in society. On the other hand, in the East, democracy is suppressed and dissenter, dissent, the dissenter automatically runs the risk of imprisonment. Even where imperialism is concerned, there is a degree of flexibility in the West absent in the East. Only a year or so ago, Reagan embraced Marcos. Today is considering consigning him to the proverbial dustbin. Not that Reagan has undergone a moral reawakening, but Marcos is becoming a political liability and American capitalism can be forced to bend, enough to allow Reagan to make an accommodation to the tremendous pressure from below exerted by the Filipino people. In the East... When the Polish people made their will manifest through solidarity, the Kremlin's response was massive maneuvers around Warsaw. The outlawing of solidarity accompanied by beatings, jailings, even murders carried out by the Comprador Junta, directed by the puppet Jaruzelski. Or Jaruzelski. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. However... If we could gather up all the wickedness of American imperialist intervention since the end of World War II and place it on one side of some judgmental balance scale of evil, the accumulated weight of American evil might not be so discernibly different from what is piled on to the other side of the scale. On the U.S. side, we would have to make room for overthrowing Mossadegh in Iran and propping up the Shah's bloody rule, subverting a relatively democratic government in Guatemala and replacing it with a rise of with a series of bloody tyrants, undermining a social democratic government in Chile and installing the brutal Pinochet dictatorship. dictatorship. Almost any dictator in Latin America could and can count on American support. The U.S. endorses Israeli imperialism and terrorist attacks on civilians, aids a pathological killer state in El Salvador, mined harbors in Nicaragua, and advises and finances an army of Contra assassins. There was the Bay of Pigs, Korea, Vietnam, Grenada. <laughs> the list could go on for pages, but there is not enough room on the U.S. side of the balance sheet. So, I mean, the balance scale. Do Soviet crimes weigh even heavier? Possibly. But how would that reduce, by even a gram, the criminal realities of American imperialism and the need to struggle against it? Moreover, on the paramount question of the day, the arms race, it is the U.S. which is the greater evil. The Kremlin has unilaterally declared a limited moratorium on testing and has taken the initiative to cut back nuclear stockpiles. It is not decisive whether the Gorbachev initiatives are taken for propaganda purposes, as Reagan says, or because the Soviet economy is so weak that the arms race is an unbearable economic burden. If it is merely propaganda, the U.S. could counter by taking the Kremlin at its word and going one better... <laughs> raise the peace ante, with an offer of a longer moratorium on testing and increases in the tempo of a phased cutback of missiles and warheads. We know from experience that the concept of lesser evilism when used as a guiding political principle tends to transform a lesser force of evil for evil into something which must be defended almost as if it were a political good. Which brings me back for one final look at the radical-cum-liberal ghost. During the Vietnam War, this ghost and his friends were appalled by the manner in which the U.S. carried on the war. They are even more appalled by the anti-war movement. It was evil, they agreed, to support the reactionary Kai and Thu puppets in South Vietnam, 
but short of a negotiated settlement with the communists, they preferred the prosecution of the war as the lesser evil to the greater evil of a total military victory of communist forces. Thus, lesser evilism as a guiding political principle led to something resembling positive support for the war, what in movement parlance is called, quote, critical support, end quote. If that is the way, quote, lesser evilism, end quote, works operationally, and it usually does, then third camp socialists will be forgiven, I hope, for our intransigent refusal to be deflected from combating capitalism by the specter of abetting that greater evil, totalitarian collectivism. The third camp versus the communist camp. At a recent meeting called to discuss the nature, assuming new section, the third camp versus the communist camp. At a recent meeting called to discuss the nature of Soviet society attended by students, some faculty, all seemingly radical, though clearly not of a single mind on the question discussed, a drawing note was struck when one of the panelists warned the audience, among whom I doubt a cold warrior could be found, to guard against, quote, knee-jerk anti-Sovietism, end quote. Quote, knee-jerk anti-Sovietism, end quote. What is that? Does this injunction apply to, quote, knee-jerk anti-fascism, end quote? Is there a special stigma attached to, quote, knee-jerk anti-capitalism or Reaganism or imperialism, end quote? Are we to guard against, quote, knee-jerk socialism, end quote? Actually, neoconservatives are prone to cheap agitation or shots against, quote, knee-jerk liberals and radicals, end quote, as well as, quote, professional anti-Americans, end quote. But we expect that of them. Perhaps I protest too much. I suppose I have been so conditioned by my commitments that I do tend to act spontaneously, as when I hear Reagan refer to the Contras as the, quote, moral equivalents of our founding fathers, end quote, or the equally absurd suggestion that the Soviet Union is, quote, a form of socialism, end quote. In the first instance, an image flashes before me of Contras torturing and murdering men, women, and children in Nicaraguan villages, and my leg does quiver reflexively. And in the second, I see Gorbachev's thugs beating into unconsciousness teenage Soviet peace activists, and without giving the matter any deep thought, my other leg begins to shake spasma spasmatically. Somehow, I sense that my strong reaction is not widely shared. That is unfortunate, for it suggests what is readily apparent in much of the left-wing press, a view that while the Soviet Union no longer serves as a socialist role model, one should not be quick to pass judgment, that the Soviet Union is, quote, too complex, end quote, a society to place in identifiable categories. It's not ideally socialist, but neither is it anti-socialist. It cannot be hailed as enlightened, but neither is it reactionary. Its economy is not organized democratically, but it is anti-capitalist, and so on. Now, I do not claim that there is no room for debate about the class nature of the Soviet Union, the role of the party, of the government apparatus, on prospects for change and reform, on dozens of other questions. But for all these debatable questions, we surely know as much as we need to be more precise and truthful. It is not that complex a society. The Soviet Union is not exactly socialist because it is exactly anti-socialist. Its economy is not organized on democratic principles because it exists in a totalitarian anti-capitalist society. To make these judgments, we know enough. The evidence has been mounting for the greater part of a century. For the sake of discussion, let me pose an abstract problem with multiple choice answers. In good academic terms, we might call it an exercise in, quote, social identification, end quote. There is a society that we will call, quote, X, end quote, and it has the following characteristics. In society, quote, X, there is but one political party whose supremacy is guaranteed by law. The party controls the political and economic life of the country. This party controls economic institutions and organizes overall plans. This party functions as the nerve and operational center of the society. And this party is beholden to know and accept itself. This party is the final arbiter of all disputes in all other social institutions. And where there are disputes within this party, these disputes are resolved by decisions of a small number of those on top. This party is self-perpetuating. In society, quote, X, end quote, there are rulers but no electorate. To qualify as an electorate, 
the people have to elect, and to elect means to be able to choose among contestants. But no one is allowed to contest the will of the party. Quote, candidates, end quote, are chosen by the authorities above, and the people have to vote for them. They do not elect them. In society, quote, X, there are no trade unions. There are organizations that call themselves unions, but these organizations have no independence from their employers, the state, and the ruling party. These unions exist primarily to rationalize production, maintain labor discipline, and because these unions provide a necessary ideological facade for the ruling powers. The unions are not allowed to strike. That is against the law. And in a few instances where workers have defied the so-called unions, the law of retribution was swift and brutal. In Society X, significant public criticism of the government and party is not allowed. That is forbidden by law and carries a stiff prison sentence for, quote, anti-social agitation and propaganda, end quote. Naturally, organized public protest is an even more serious offense. In Society X, women are excluded de facto from the top levels of government and state. At best, there is what other societies call a token representation at lower political levels. Women have the hardest and lowest paid jobs and are expected, in addition, to queue up for food, then cook and clean for the family. Society X is officially atheist, but more than that, it limits the right of individuals to practice religion. Society X particularly dislikes the Jewish religion. In fact, it dislikes the Jewish people. They are not only considered disloyal to party and state, but personally odd and distasteful. So the party-controlled press, there is no non-party-controlled press, has occasional little feature stories with cartoons of Jews with very long noses and a sly demeanor engaging in ignoble practices. The Jews are commonly referred to in Society X as, quote, kikes. A huge number of these, quote, so-called, quote, kikes, so unwanted by Society X, are nevertheless not permitted to leave the country. It does seem contradictory on the surface. If you despise a person or people, one would imagine that a group or a state would be only too delighted to have these pariahs leave their fold. It doesn't work that way in Society X, which, as you can already see, is a very complicated system that doesn't lend itself to easy definition. Society X is a great military power, perhaps the world's most powerful, Yet Society X's propaganda, yet in this society's propaganda, this society is dedicated to peace and has been for many decades. But its armies are growing bigger as are its tanks and nuclear weapons. It argues that being for peace doesn't mean to disarm yourself. The approach is reminiscent of the recent statement by the Secretary of Defense of a power in competition with Society X that a cut in the defense budget is tantamount to unilateral disarmament. Society X is so devoted to peace that it spends huge amounts of its currency on maintaining an official peace organization. The peace organization, of course, is tightly controlled by the party to which the military is subordinate. While peace-loving forces in the party and military are devoted to their peace organization, they will not permit any independent peace organization to exist as a legal entity. In fact, as this questionnaire about Society X is being prepared, where it has just been received that a dozen or so independent peace activists who have been brutally assaulted and and some thrown in prison in psychiatric jails by government security forces. Some of these security forces may well be members of the official peace organization. Society X claims that it needs a huge army not only to defend its own borders, it is a large country, but it needs tanks and troops in a vast adjacent area, which is the protective custody is in the productive custody of the party-state motherland. Of course, it turns out that Society X also needs tanks and troops in foreign nations in its custody to defend itself from the wrath of the people in these foreign lands who do not want to, and never did, be in the custody of Society X. The party propagandists in X are proud to announce that there is no unemployment in their society and there are wonderful social programs in medicine, housing, child care, etc., Now, there are those who deny the full employment claim, but what can hardly be disputed is that despite the welfare programs, Society X enjoys, if that is the right word, the lowest living standards of any modern industrial state. Rents are cheap, but the quality of housing is abysmal and overcrowding is notorious. Wages relative to prices are extremely low, and consumer goods are in short supply. Judged by poverty-level standards of competing nations, we would have to conclude that Society X is a nation of rather poor people. Although there are many poor people in Society X, 
not everyone is deprived. In fact, wage deferentials in X are vast and there are considerable numbers of party and state functionaries who enjoy huge salaries and special privileges, more than enough to buy country homes, purchase cars or have them at their disposal as a prerequisite per, a perquisite of power, and have plenty left over to purchase designer blue jeans and similar luxury items, including pornography, on the black market. Culturally and intellectually, Society X might be described overall as a desert. It is proficient in certain traditional arts, such as the dance, but, in, but intellectual freedom of expression and cultural experimentation are out of the question in X. It is considered unhealthy, and correctly so, for the welfare of the party state. Much that exists in that society that is innovative and of interest in literature, philosophy, the arts, political thought, can be found only in the underground culture. Life is so culturally impoverished and drab that X is beset, perhaps more than any other modern state, by problems of alienation. Working people, in particular, have so little to say about the direction of their lives in the workplace or society as a whole that they tend to drink like sturgeons, the national brew, not water. Absenteeism is chronic and workers are notoriously indifferent to the fulfillment of production quotas. All this is admitted by a new leadership of X, which is plans for economic reforms. Top priority is to be given to overcoming what is called, quote, labor and discipline, end quote. Workers on the job will simply have to turn over a new leaf, put their collective shoulders to the production wheel, or, as the new reforming, reforming head of state has made explicit, taught a lesson in how tough their ultimate boss can be. Now, the above, in outlined fashion, is a description of Society X, and so we present our, to our, quote, excuse me, and so we present to our anti-quote, knee-jerk, anti-Sovietist, end quote, two multiple choice questions. The first concerns characterization, and we must check one of the following. X most closely approximates a liberal society, a social democratic society, a feudal society, a socialist society, a reactionary society. Now surely those to whom this question is offered will respond on the basis of my outlines that X is a reactionary society. Good. Now we come to the second multiple choice questions, which narrows the equation to one of identity. X, X, most closely equals the Principality of Monaco, Andorra, Sudan, the U.S., Liechtenstein, the Soviet Union. Check one, and here I am afraid the jig is up. It becomes clear that this is all the ploy of a, quote, knee-jerk anti-Sovietist, end quote, for obviously what I have described as X is the Soviet Union, and it simply goes against the grain and prejudices of so many in the left for all their reservations and misgivings about Soviet society to damn such societies as reactionary. They are not about to fall into such a trap. But why not? Have I said anything that is inaccurate, that does not correspond to the basic realities of Soviet society? Those who react reflexively against knee-jerk anti-Sovietists, however, are not so easily disarmed. They have their rationalizations. For one thing, they said, me, for one thing, they say, as the problem is posed, it fails to mention that X has a, quote, nationalized economy, end quote. I am sorry for the oversight, but how does a nationalized economy change anything in and of itself for the better or for the worse? A nationalized economy is an abstraction, and what gives the nationalized con economy content is the nature of the nation that has nationalized the means of production. If I might invoke Marx at this point, he never suggested a nationalized economy as the necessary and sufficient condition for socialism. For Marx, as for most socialists, the first responsibility of a successful revolution from below is the establishment of political democracy. For Marx, as for third camp socialists today, the character of nationalization depends on who does the nationalizing. Is the nationalized economy subject to the democratic control of the masses of people through their unions, collectives, parties, i.e. the control of their state? Or is the economy the property of a party state which can only sustain its authority on the basis of its political expropriation of the working classes? As for the Soviet Union being anti-capitalist, that too in itself adds little to the discussion. It is indeed anti-capitalist, but that does not make it pro-socialistic or progressive in any sense. When the Soviet Union is again, excuse me, what the Soviet Union is against does not tell us what the Soviet Union is.
That's a great paragraph. I'm going to read it again because I think that's the most insightful thing about um, the bureaucratic collectivist uh, position as opposed to state capitalist positions is that um, um, whether or not the Soviet Union is uh, anti-capitalist is uh, or like is not the fundamental question of whether does not answer the question of whether or not it is socialist or even socialistic. Um, so I'm going to repeat that uh, last paragraph again. As for the Soviet Union being anti-capitalist, that, too, in itself adds little to the discussion. It is indeed anti-capitalist, but that does not make it pro-socialistic or progressive in any sense. What the Soviet Union is against does not tell us what it is. However, it is argued... The Soviet Union is not a homogenous society without divisions and conflicts. It is subject to change and reform. But no one has argued, to my knowledge, that communist societies are homogenous and that reforms are impossible. Footnote. There are not only conflicts and contradictions within the Soviet Union, but within the Soviet Empire between the Imperial Kremlin and its comprador ruling classes in Central and Eastern Europe, which have their own national ambitions and interests that threaten the surface harmony of the, quote, family of socialist nations, end quote. Moreover, there is overt conflict within the communist world between the Soviet Union and virtually every communist country where a new ruling class has come to power largely on the basis of its own resources and national historical development. Soviet Stalinism, or capital C Communism, has already been intensely nationalistic, suspicious, and distrustful of any mass communist movement, and even prepared to sabotage communist-led revolutions which might lead to an independent and therefore a potentially rival totalitarian one-party state. These contradictions, conflicts, schisms within the communist world also offer possibilities for change from above and resistance and of resistance from below. But while the changes from above have definite theoretical limits, resistance from below has the potential of widening the schism, threatening the whole totalitarian edifice. And footnote. That would fly in the face of reality. In the Soviet Union, there is conflict, first of all, between the working class and the ruling class, which is not what the anti anti Sovietists have in mind. And there is conflict within the ruling class itself, between state economic administrators, all sorts of government functionaries, and the military. For example, who have their own special interests which do not always comport to the planes of the ruling party, which has the responsibility for integrating all subordinate governmental and state institutions. Even within the party, there are differences among the apparatchiks. These conflicts within the ruling class do allow for reforms. The question is, what are the limits of reform in this type of society? Just as the question is the limit to, limits to reforms in capitalist societies. In communist societies, all reforms are possible, theoretically, except those which undercut the totalitarian character of class rule. No ruling class will immolate itself. Therefore, in communist societies, reforms from above that deny the political, i.e. class supremacy of the party, are excluded. Just as in capitalist societies, reforms that overturn bourgeois property relations are fanciful. In the communist world, then, the possibility of reform ends where genuine political democracy begins. There can be no multiplicity of parties, no democratic contestation for political and therefore economic power by parties representing the mass of people from below. Excuse me, mass of people below. We know about Gorbachev and his economic reforms, his alleged liberalism. Ever since Stalin died, with each succeeding general secretary, we have been promised to significant reforms and liberalization from Malenkov to Khrushchev to Brezhnev, to Andropov, even to Chernenko, when he was wheeled in, we have been told by one or another, quote, Russian expert, end quote, or apologist, that liberal reforms were on the horizon, and there have been some reforms which all socialists welcome. Nevertheless, these general secretaries are prepared to go to any bloody length to beat down any movement from below that aspires to freedom. Is Gorbachev the exception? Absolutely not. What can he do or want to do 
reform the economy, make it more efficient, tighten, quote, labor discipline, end quote, fight against pervasive corruption, release some prisoners of conscience while jailing others, all these things he can do. But liberalize society in any fundamental sense? Never. The truth of the matter is that some of his economic reforms might even lead to a tightening of party controls. Finally, it is argued that at least where the third world is concerned, the Soviet Union is progressive, at least the lesser evil, and here I must simply throw up my hands in frustration, but not before a comment or two. In the Cold War, it is clearly to the Kremlin's advantage to send arms and personnel to Syria and to Angola, if that is what is meant by advancing third world revolutions. It will send some assistance to the Sandinistas. That, too, is useful, but do not doubt that there is a political price tag on the rifles. What would the Kremlin send if the Sandinistas acted in accordance with democratic principles in the reorganization of their society, and if in the spirit of anti-imperialism they supported the struggle of the Polish people instead of giving their support to Jaruzelski? Certainly, the Soviet Union might aid the ANC, the African National Congress, but what would it do so even if the ANC declared its political independence from all foreign imperialism and, if it should come to power, try to build in South Africa an independent, democratic, anti-imperialist state that makes no moral and political distinction between the imperialism of the West and the imperialism of the East? Last but not least, how can any reasonable person devoted to socialist principles isolate whatever the Kremlin is or is not doing in the third world from what it is doing in its own empire in Eastern and Central Europe? For third camp socialists, there is nothing at all ambiguous about our characterization of communist society. Totalitarian collectivism is not a form of socialism, but an expression of reactionary class rule. We are not deceived for a moment by its ideology which selectively utilizes the symbols and idioms of socialism. Instead, we are alarmed at the fact that so many on the left cannot see through the transparent ideological disguise of a system driven to destroy socialism in theory and practice. Final section. Quote, The liberation of the working class is the work of the workers alone. End quote is more than a line from a socialist anthem. It sums up a notion that is relevant and basic to the concepts of third camp socialism. It is suggestive of one socialist vision, vision and capsulizes much that is distinctive in the fight for socialism or what separates our struggle from the great bourgeois revolutions of the past. The English and French bourgeoisies lacked the will, the energy and numbers to make their own revolution. The revolution was made for them by alien classes of the poor and depressed for whom an eventually triumphant bourgeoisie would show neither appreciation nor mercy once the power of lord and prelate was broken. To establish the social rule of, to establish the social rule of a minority capitalist class, all that was necessary was to establish the primacy of the market or the, as the regulator of production and to destroy feudal restrictions imposed on the growth and accumulation of capital. By contrast, the working class, which is a majority class and propertyless, can establish its own social rule only on the basis of its heightened class consciousness and its democratic reorganization of society. A socialist transformation cannot be achieved by a well-meaning elite, nor by an inhospitable liberal capitalist class, nor by an alien totalitarian class, and only by mass struggle from below. This emphasis on the rule of consciousness, on the importance of democracy, on the need to build movements from below, was championed by Marx, but far from accepted by a majority of the broadly defined working class movement of the 19th century. Alas, in the contemporary left, also broadly defined, the validity of these revolutionary democratic concepts are denied in theory and or practice by an even wider margin. On the one side are the elitist social democratic parties fearful of militant mass movements from below, and from another side there are those who believe that autocratic rulers and governing totalitarian parties can serve the cause of peace and social progress. Third Camp Socialism is a reaffirmation of the radical democratic strain of international socialism. 
For third camp socialists, political and social democracy and the belief in the ability and necessity of working people to govern their own lives are at the core of our socialism. We cannot recognize socialism in any other guise. This is not to suggest that third camp socialism is a sectarian and rigid dogma which provides a, quote, correct line, end quote, on all political questions. The concept is broad enough to embrace a rich variety of views, strategy, and programs. But what is imperative is the acceptance of democracy as a common denominator of socialism if we are to overcome the, quote, crisis of socialism, end quote, over which we have agonized for so many decades. For the crisis is also in socialism, a crisis of self-definition of who we are and what we want. And since we are convinced that it is the responsibility of socialists to wave the banner of peace, freedom, and democracy with one hand, then it confirms that the other hand must be raised in a clenched fist as both affirmation of socialism and in defiance of all the little people in high places who control our lives, against those societies which oppress humanity and threaten its existence, against the Reagans and the Gorbachevs, the Thatchers and Castros, the Pinochets, and Yaroselskys against the two camps of capitalism and totalitarian collectivism. The end. Thanks for listening.